Can I just start there? Um, it's now they reconstructed. The town has reconstructed it again. It's not in disrepair anymore. They're taking great care of it. They have a much bigger sign. Um, and so this was what the winter fishing huts were like. This is what they were. They were sort of like the Irish black huts. They're sawed on the top to keep them warm. They didn't have any wood. Iceland doesn't have trees. So they had, they built them out of stone. And they, a lot of times, didn't have fires in them either. They were cold. But the sod would keep it more, it was very good insulation. And that's what they had. Um, go ahead. <coughs> These are paintings uh, by a guy, Jeremy Jonsson. This is, it's not correct, actually. But this is a painting of the, um, the sorry, go back, can you yes, go back? I'm sorry. <laughs> to hold you. Oh, no. Well, that, I'll tell you, she's trying to figure it out. The, um, that boat, it was the woman, they, he actually painted this woman, who is the skipper of that boat, and she is Haldora. And she's also called Haldora. All the time, although there's never mention of any disability. <coughs> but she actually, she mostly, this is the 1700s, she mostly always took all female crews. She didn't, she always had an all, all female crews. And she had two brothers who also had, had boats. It's a fairly wealthy family. So they had three boats. All the siblings were running them. And they used to have competitions all the time. Guess who won? Almost always. In fact, it, it was said that she made her brothers wealthy because she brought in so much fish. So she was quite a remarkable person too. She also took people. She also um, stood up on behalf of other women and went to court. One thing, the court system in Iceland did work. And it's not was great. She took people to court as well. If you had the wherewithal to do it. So I'll say one other thing that was very interesting while we're waiting for this is that we also found this law. This is remarkable. I have to go to Denmark because I don't know anything about why this law was enacted. That's sort of my next, in my next research, I'm going to sneak over there and do it. I don't have the grant to do it, but we're just going to. So it's, it's, we found that in 1720, 1720, there was a law enacted by the Danish king, Frederick, for Icelanders, for women to get the same wage as men for the men's work of cutting sod, cutting peat, and rolling, which in Iceland means fishing. I still use this word for it today. So that meant that from 1720, women got an equal share to men. And as far as I could find, that has always been honored. Now it was that they had this system where you were basically indentured to a farmer, so you were a farmhand, and if you were a woman working for the farmer, the farmer got your share, and then you got trapped. But if you could do it independently, you got an equal share. And that is still the case today. So it was a one way that women could make equal wages to men. And even in the 1990s, in Iceland, <coughs> rural Iceland, up until the 1990s, because the, the fish factories played crap, Women earned 55% of what men earned. It's gender equality. Mm -hmm. Whereas if they went to sea, they could get equal wages. And so this is what a lot of women said. I was a teenager. I was working in a fish factory. All the guys were making tons of money. Why couldn't they? And so they go and do it. And that's, or women get divorced. That's how they look after their children. It's quite remarkable. It's because they can make money. So if we can work this way. We can't. We can't. We can't. What I can do is, why don't you just, if anybody has some questions, you can just ask the questions, because that's basically what I can say. Um, How many in a boat? What's that? How many women were in a boat? It, it, yeah, just say your questions, because in the dark, you can't really. Just go ahead. Um, it was, it, they, they didn't have sails in Iceland until like 1850 to the late 1800s, but it was usually, they had as few as four up to eight, usually, people in the boat. They weren't larger than that, and I think one thing, the Icelandic population so, was so low that it was, they couldn't, and they couldn't really take larger boats, they didn't have enough crew in each area because they would be scattered farms. The boats were also incredibly expensive because they had to bring them over from 
Norway a lot, and Denmark, because they didn't have the trees, they both wouldn't, and they didn't have the trees to build them, so they had to be imported. So that was very expensive. Um, Did they use nets? No, each person had their own tackle and line, and this was also very, very um, uh, prized, because the Danish had a monopoly, and so you could only get sort of what they allowed coming to Iceland. So twine was really valued. And so everybody had their own tackle, and they jealously kept that. And so each person on the boat was fishing, line fishing, off their own, their own tackle. That's very interesting. So, you know, and they have this word called fisting, which means you attract the fish to you. So if you, if you take that, get a fish, if you got fish a lot, then you became known as fisting. And people really wanted you on the boat. Didn't matter if you did it at all. You'd be very sorry. Yeah. They were great in the yeah. Oh, oh, oh it's, it's quite dramatic. Yeah, it's, it's great stories. So, and you know, yeah. I was thinking it was the the death rates from those tra tragic disease epidemics, as well as the Danish servitude. Really built robust people. I mean, I would think that women may have been, you know, really healthy, robust. They they were. It was intriguing though, because we had this system that there were times people, if you weren't able to uh, support your kids, or if one of them died, or if you, like one of the parents died, or if they're too poverty, you were farmed out. This is how the farmers kept their labor, in the labor, and basically almost free labor, the elite of all the other. It was basically a serf system. And so, if you had nobody, uh, you didn't usually get enough food. And so, it says in the comment, she was particularly strong, having always gotten enough food. So that was a really important thing. And these, when they go to the fishing stations in the summer, they would have these, where they would live in very rudimentary housing, sometimes just in caves. And during the migration system, people would go to these areas where the fish were, close to shore, and they would get tons of fish and, and you know, salt it and dry it and stuff like that. And it was it was it was difficult to row there. They had to row a long way, and then they'd stay there in these very harsh conditions. But these women really liked it because they got enough food there. It was a very different situation. They weren't under the thumb of a farmer. Um, and then I thought about it later, and there are all these scattered farms with nobody around except the farmer and the wife and then who they are. Whereas when they're in these fishing stations, it was actually a real community. And at that time, there really weren't much in the way of towns in Iceland. And that was the, like, they all said it's a fun and free environment. Women talked about that, and they try and negotiate to go there if they were a farmer. So, yeah, you're right. They, if they got enough to eat, they were. And then, they had the highest infant mortality rate in Europe until the late 1800s. And one thing, this woman who did this great book called The State of the Child, and I signed she, book, was book, so it was she found out that they didn't breastfeed their kids. And they were feeding them water down cow's milk and things like that, and the kids were dying. And that, then the, finally by the 1800s, late 1800s, they got them to change. Oh, good. And so within, by the early 1900s, they then had the highest infant survival in Europe. Totally switched from one to the other. And it's what you're suggesting, Joan, I think people say it's because their food was clean, their water was clean. If you survived infancy, then your chances of surviving to a you know, good old age were really high in Iceland, unlike most of Europe at that, for quite some time, even for impoverished people. So this is this, how there is well, painted, but slightly inaccurate because they have all men. But he said for her. Is it, oh, very few pictures of women in the past. Only, okay, go ahead. Can you go forward? Mm -hmm. Oh, good. So this you see, he has this, this is a pic just a picture of, you know, the boats would just flip really easily. Later they had sails. They were round on a boat, so they would really flip really easily. And this is just a, a depiction of this. Go ahead. And then here, they would bring them in through the surf. So they'd be rowing, surfing, and this is a lava shore. And then they would drag them up on shore, and they'd use whale ribs as rollers. 
they have wood, remember? So they'd use whale ribs and they just roll them up on whale ribs and then run around and take it to the back. And that's how they took them down, too. What marvelous. Go ahead. Oh, there it is. Oh, good. So one thing that I was really happy. Oh, no. Peter Mel. So that last picture, one, that, this is taken in 19... Is one more. One more. one more. Can you yeah. give back one more? Yeah, I'm just trying. Please. There we go. This is from 1900. Um, and this is, they're larger by then. They've got, the, the, this is a larger boat. Um, and they had more people. This, of course, more people who would be rowing. It's obviously a Sunday. They're all dressed up in their Sunday best. <laughs> and they've got a sail. But uh, looking at the register of this boat, there were more women than men working on this boat. And they're all there. It's amazing to have this picture on photograph from 1900 of this boat with these women. Okay, go ahead. Okay, this one I was really excited when we found. We found, we found all these in the archives. I have to say, Iris from the Maritime Museum in Iceland helped me find these. This is a fan, this from 1944, and you can see they're still using the old style boat. I'm sure they've got a motor on it at this point, but it's still got the old Orlocks. This is obviously a very old boat. They're still using the family. And they're still using the lines up. So this obviously looks like a husband and wife and some other probably crew member. So, but this little boy, all these women that I interviewed now, I'd say, so how old were you when you first went out to sea with your family? And they go, five, six. I go, really? Five or six? And they go, yeah, 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 yeah. Really, I went out when I was two, but I wasn't really working then. <laughs> So I thought, but I heard this again and again and again, that's how they become fishermen. They go out with their families really young, and the women do, the girls do, as well as the boys. And I thought, nobody's going to believe me. I'm sorry. I'm going to say this and everybody say, yeah, right. Photograph. Huh. It's a boy, but it's somebody, he looks like he's about five or six. This is just some women fishing um, in the, um, they fished through the, two women fished, they went out together for about 20 years together. Um, they've both retired now, um, but one of them, the one time they didn't go out together, one of them got it, their boat crashed. And the other one, it was, I have the story in the book, it's very, she made it through it all, getting spoiled, but thank goodness, she made it through it, but it was terrifying. They said, never again, we'll never go out separately again. So, is that the fish in the water beside it? Yeah, 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 exactly. It's the net and it's the fish coming out from the net, exactly. <coughs> Yeah, go ahead. Um, this is another woman in Bali who, um, she fishes with her family, she fishes with her, uh, her husband, her daughter, her son, and her daughter-in-law. So that's their, they have three boats they run now, they're doing very well, actually. Fishing for, they have a whole, this whole complicated with um, the quotas, the fishing, getting the fishing rights, which they privatized in Iceland for cod, but they fish for a fish called grasslepper, which is um, lungfish. I've never heard of it, honestly. It's an Arctic fish. Now they, they just take its roe. Although now they're finding things to do with its meat as well, sending it to Asia. It's a very fatty. What type of fish was that? Lungfish. It's round. Um, and they just take its roe and sell it in Asia. So, um, here, this is a woman named Lina. She's got this hilarious story. She's been fishing. She's been working at sea about oh, 35 years, 37 years. Um, and she gives this hilarious story also about how she, how she first got on sea. Is she thought, well, nobody's going to take me. She said, I really want to go to sea. And so, she, so she went to fishery school and became a, like an inspector, a fisheries inspector. And she has been doing that now for, for some years. Go ahead. Um, and here she is at the helm. <coughs> now she's very experienced. She also, which I don't have, but she's got, she, gave me, she gave me a whole bunch of pictures. Some of them with her rifle. All this ammunition around her head. And then there's another one with her holding a bird. Dead bird, obviously, got with the rifle. I might say that shooting a bird from a moving boat, you have to get a bloody shot. So, okay. Um, this is a woman, Sigrid, and she is the first woman to become a large vessel skipper. She started in the 70s. Um, to, and she became um, qualified as a skipper of the largest vessels, Coast Guard, everything. And she spent a lot of her um, career traveling around the world. 
and um, a lot in first mate positions. And uh, she's now trying to become a kindergarten teacher, actually. <laughs> so, go ahead. She says she loves both. She says they're both wonderful to do. Is this going? It's in the oh, okay. This, I love this picture. These the last two pictures, I just have because I just love them. This woman in the middle is Ngapani. She was also one of the very first um, to become a qualified skipper. Um, and she worked on fishing boats for a long time. This is, she's now, she just had her 60th birthday, actually. And she's been working at sea this whole time, all around the world. Um, she went and worked in um, Namibia for three years. Her husband, who was also a skipper, um, but he took three years off to take care of their kid and went to Namibia with them. So they took turns being caregiver. Um, but, because in these boats, she'd be gone for as much as a month at a time. But here, she is first mate. This is, and these are her crew. And just to give you an example, I mean, they look like they totally adore her. I mean, it's pretty obvious. There's the, yeah. <laughs> so she's also as cute as Why wouldn't they? Yeah. Why wouldn't they? That's exactly my question. I know. She was like, Princess Diana. So I'm amazed how many people I've met, how many women I've met who say, oh, that looks just like me when I'm sharing her. Anyway, go on. And this is the last one. I love this photograph. This is her again. And she, when she said she was the, of the first mate on these boats, these early boats, she now works on container ships, by the way. She said, look, when you're younger, you do the fishing. When you get older, I'm sorry, container ships are just more comfortable. <laughs> <laughs> so she does. She does this great trip. Which I was supposed to take this fall. I didn't get to go. I can go later on. It goes from the pharaohs down to Europe, comes back. So here she, she she hired these other two women. She said, screw it, you know. They were friends of hers, she really liked them. So here she is the first name. She, the next um, woman is the deckhand, and she's the cook for this um, trawl that they were on. So it's just a great picture when she was younger. So so that's really basically the pictures. I just want to show you some pictures. It gives you an idea of the vibrancy of everything. And to tell you, because University of Washington Press has me take books. With me, so I do have books to sell. They have these books. So if you'd like me to sign them, so let me sell them. So that's it. So I don't know if you want any questions. We get a few questions. I don't know how much more time you've got. If anybody would. Well, it's, it's almost an hour. Um, does anybody have any quick questions for me? Yeah. You said about salt, salt in fish. Yeah. Who brought the salt in? And the salt in? It was imported from here. Okay. It was brought on by the dance. You're right. Exactly. That was, that was a huge thing. And the salt was expensive. Mm -hmm. But salt was really interesting. And they also dry them. The, the air is really dry, mm -hmm. and so they, they hung them up a lot. It looked like Native American. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, they, were, they still do this today. Yeah. Actually, it's the most expensive fish. It's the most expensive fish you can get. Yeah. That's how you get blue fish. <laughs> There's just a blue fish. They have the fermented shark, but they have the. It's it's really hard. Yeah, stone hard. Yeah. Stone hard. Yeah. yeah. You have to soak it. <clears throat> is that blue fish? I thought that was yeah. from there. It's reconstituted in lava. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then it becomes oh, okay. Right. <laughs> Sounds good. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you could come with. Are you going to have that? No, no, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, February 4th. <laughs> <laughs> so I love the Arctic. I didn't think the Arctic was there, but then I went on this hike with this friend of mine. This Icelandic friend of mine. And it was a killer hike where you do it in 24 hours. You do it in the day in the summer and you just hike over the top. It's called the Kakadu, the catwalk. So you're walking like in a thing this wide and it goes off a thousand feet on each side. We ended up, oh, it's too long a story, but we ended up in a uh, blizzard. And there is a hut up there. So we're in a blizzard in the hut and we're thinking, and we're really au pair. Somebody took au pairs up there and they were crying. We can't do it. <laughs> so we're stuck up there. And this, I'm saying, oh God. She's saying, okay, look, I've got a GPS. We're going to go out as soon as we can go. We're moving on. I said, you know, all right, fine. And she said, what we need is some energy. I said, okay. She pulled out this dried fish. Right? She slapped some butter on it. She said, here. I 
I started bottling it down. It was the best thing that I've ever had. I thought it was delicious. At that time, it's okay now. But at that time, it was all cool. And again, it's a huge amount of energy. And I thought, that was shit. Very good energy. Dry fish and bun. I'm sold on it now. Most of the fish in this country that so called smoke is actually kippered salmon. It's not smoked salmon. The true smoked salmon.